Corrupt Authority by yours truly. In his barely conscious state, Kenta could feel his ruined body rising and falling by weight. Around him, the wind screamed and pushed upon him, threatening to throw him off the side of whatever platform he was lying upon. Yet every time he rolled to the side, he'd feel something long and thick push him back to his original spot. Opening his eyes the smallest bit, Kenta noticed that it was a red wing, a salamence's wing. All at once, he pieced together what must have happened, unimaginable though it must be. Bolt? A salamence? Had he really done it? Had he evolved and become the Dragonite of the Hoenn region? But he, Kenta, should not be surprised. On the day he captured Bolt, he had succeeded only because the little Bagon had first thrown himself headfirst off a cliff in Meteor Falls in an attempt to fly. Once the capture and the concussion had passed, Kenta had knelt down to his newest little Pokemon and put out his pinky finger to make a promise. Train and become strong with us, Kenta had told the young Bolt, and one day we will fly together. And they'd pinky swore, Kenta with a finger and Bolt with his teeth. Later, Kenta had joked about it being the most painful promise he'd ever have to keep. How fitting it was. Bolt was now flying for the first time in his life, and he, Kenta, was in more pain than ever. It felt as though his abdominals were straining without him flexing them to get out the bullet that wasn't there. He'd been pierced straight through the back and out his stomach so that there were two holes in his body that formed a miniature tunnel right through. One of his hands had found the spot on its own and lay pressed against it in an attempt to keep the lifeblood inside. Staunching the blood flow didn't seem to be working though. He continued to bleed regardless. Kenta didn't know how long it took for Bolt to reach where he was going. Time had no meaning anymore. Nothing really did, with certain death approaching. He'd lost too much blood. He had no more sense of touch, and his other senses seemed on their way out as well. When they had at last touched the ground again, and Kenta rolled off Bolt's back, he didn't feel any impact. He didn't even feel the temperature around them, although judging by the light snowfall, it must have been freezing. And somewhat to his relief, he was starting to go numb of the stinging pain in his chest, which now felt no worse than a Weedle's poison. Yet there was a fear in his heart, which kept him from embracing the sweet release death seemed to be promising him. The American missionary that had come to New Barktown years back, the one whom he'd brushed off at the time, had mentioned something about dying that he had never given much thought to until this very moment. Death, he'd said, wasn't the end. Anyone who died went on, but only in one of two directions, towards the creator of the universe or away from that same creator. Those who had never known him in life, and thus could never thank him for the sun's warmth, the delicious variety of food tastes, the vast multitude of the world's scents and the flamboyant colors, and so on, these people would not search for him in death. Why was Kenta wondering about him now? Perhaps it was because his senses were fading. You don't know what you got till it's gone, the saying went. But Kenta felt a sudden appreciation for life, even now. Why make promises? Why go on living for a better tomorrow? Why create bonds with people and Pokemon if everything was just going to die anyway? Because what if, what if the creator reflected himself in everybody? What if he was reflected in everything? What if he'd always been there and Kenta had always just been too preoccupied to notice? One thing was for sure, he certainly wasn't preoccupied with anything now. I just want to live, he found himself thinking. If I were to live a little longer, I could know whether or not I was created by someone for a purpose or if I'm just here because I'm here. But but the latter possibility was depressing to him, and Kento wished for death if it was indeed the ultimate reality. On the other hand, if he did live for a purpose, he'd fulfill it to his best ability. And during that time and afterward, he'd earnestly seek for that one, the one who had created him to fulfill such a purpose. Hold it, Hibiki interrupted, and Kenta came out of his trance from storytelling. He and Marina looked at Hibiki in annoyance, but the latter took no notice. Kenta, I haven't forgotten what you said before. You told me you'd survived because you'd been shot by Arcada, and you didn't want to die betrayed. And now you're saying... I wasn't lying, replied Kenta defensively. To me, Arcada represents the government's betrayal best. 
I had a will to live so I could fulfill my purpose, and that purpose is to come back from nothing and defeat corrupt authority, he thought for a moment. And Arcada, if I'm able to face him in battle. Can we get back to this story now? asked Marina, an enchanted look still in her eyes from Kenta's vocal memoir. I want to hear how Kenta survived! Yeah, and when does Zapdos come into this? asked Hibiki. Kenta raised an eyebrow at Hibiki. If you would kindly stop interrupting, I was just getting to that, he said pleasantly, his voice nevertheless dripping with sarcasm. So, anyway, I noticed that for someone on the brink of death, my mind was functioning awfully well. All at once, Kenta felt something powerful and gripping jolt through his body, and he sprang up from his prostrate posture like a startled animal. His senses, which a moment ago had been faint as though he'd been asleep, now roared to the forefront of his being. Around him, he felt the frigid air of the mountain climate, and he heard the howl of high winds. His eyes beheld a dazzling golden creature looming before him, with outstretched wings and crackling bolts of electricity snapping all around its glowing body. Standing between the creature and Kenta, Bolt the Salamence bared his teeth and bellowed a ferocious roar that echoed through the mountain tops. And was he imagining it? Or was there a hint of lamentation in the dragon's bellow? Kenta took his eyes off the immediate situation for just a moment and glanced down at his gut, where the bullet hole was, or should have been. His eyes widened in astonishment. Nothing was there now, but new skin with a red patch around it, and some sort of colorless liquid substance. Was it water? No, it felt warm. Even in the frigid cold, its temperature stayed constant. But how? His eyes traveled upwards, stopping as they caught sight of Bolt's face. The Salamence's eyes glistened with tears, and they fell from his face as freely as rain. But Kenta only beheld the sight for a moment, and then Bolt charged furiously at the golden creature, his head lowered like a battering ram. It fell backwards as they made contact, then gained altitude and hovered above the dragon with its body fully extended. Kenta's heart skipped a beat as he recognized at last what this deadly, magnificent creature was. Zapdos, the Thunderbird. I'm actually seeing Zapdos face to face. From Zapdos' outstretched wings, vines of electricity crackled and snapped in a dangerous light show, then suddenly merged as one bolt of lightning. Kenta's Pokemon, Bolt, barely managed to throw up a protect shield quickly enough as the electric power swarmed around his monstrous frame. Kenta watched for a moment in dumbfounded awe, then shook his head rapidly and slapped himself in the face. What's wrong with me? He thought angrily. Bolt only just evolved! He's barely adjusted to his Salamence body! He's no match for a legendary bird! Looking around for something to defend with, Kenta's eyes fell upon something purple and round, lying forgotten in the snow near Bolt's footprints. Recognizing the item, he dove and snatched it up, not caring that some freezing snow had gotten onto his bare hands. Righting himself, Kenta twisted around and faced the battle once more between the two gigantic winged Pokémon. He gritted his teeth. This isn't a normal clash. This is life or death. If I don't interfere, we're done for. And before he knew it, the Master Ball had left his hand, whirling fast and hard at Zapdos, and striking the glowing bird upon its right wing. Almost immediately, the surroundings grew dim as Zapdos disappeared into the Capture Ball and it fell to the ground. Bolt let off his Protect Shield, and both Trainer and Pokemon looked on as the Master Ball rattled violently back and forth on the snowy ground. For 30 seconds, the vigorous shaking went on and a couple of times, the Master Ball even sprang off the ground as though it had a life of its own. Thirty more seconds passed, a full minute, and still the Master Ball vibrated as though it would explode at any moment. Kenta hardly dared to breathe, and as he watched the Master Ball continue to tremble, a disturbing question pounded in his mind. What if this doesn't work? What if the Master Ball can't take it? He didn't know how long he waited. The Zapdos within the ball continued to fight valiantly for a longer time than he'd ever thought possible to cage a Pokemon. But at one point, the ball suddenly stopped quivering. Kenta stared down at it, hardly daring to believe his eyes, but the ball continued to lie dormant for as long as he watched. Then slowly, very slowly, he approached the Master Ball and picked it up, never once taking his eyes off of it, not even to look at his Salamence. He held the ball high, feeling its weight, and not sensing any difference.
but he knew better. Unreal. Unimaginable. I'm holding living lightning in my hand. Kenta finally turned and looked at Bolt, and his dragon Pokemon looked back at him, both too stunned to make a sound. Then, just as slowly as he'd picked up the Master Ball, Kenta pushed it into his pocket. The spell broke as another sudden realization struck him. His pocket was missing a Pokeball. The lockpick was there, and in his left pocket, Bolt's former Everstone and his Luxury Ball. But no normal Pokeball. That meant no Bakufun either. Had he dropped it somewhere? But how could that be? Bolt's Luxury Ball was tucked away safely. Surely he would have shown all the more care for his first and favorite Pokemon, his Typhlosion, when storing his ball. Unless it was warped away by Silhouette's registration unit. Of course! How had he not seen that coming? His own police force boasted the same teleportation technology that warped every seventh Pokemon to the PC storage system whenever a trainer's party was full after a capture. Both Pokemon he'd registered as an officer, but Kufun and Bolt could be just taken from him at a moment's notice, teleported away to the base while in their respective balls. He had shown severe insubordination just before getting shot. Small wonder Baku was gone. Wait a minute. Kenta's eyes widened in realization. Bolt is still with me. I never recalled him into his luxury ball. His large eyes narrowed. And I never can again. Reaching into his pocket, Kenta withdrew the luxury ball, looking at it with mixed feelings. I'll just have to destroy Bolt's ball, he thought, to show Silhouette that I'm cutting my ties with them. But... But something still bothers me about doing this. He looked at Bolt, who was still watching him. The Salamence's face was difficult to read, but his head was tilted. Uncertain of what he could be thinking about, Kenta held up the luxury ball for his Pokemon to see. See this? He murmured. This ball used to be the symbol of our pact, and also of our friendship. But now, it's become corrupt, a symbol of the government's hold on us. I love it, and I hate it for what it is. He cringed inwardly, but pressed on. I'm going to crush it. You may not understand what I'm doing at first, but just know that I am forever your friend. Kenta dropped the luxury ball into the snow, between himself and Bolt. Slowly and deliberately, he walked forward, keeping his eyes locked with Bolt's, who looked back at him with unusual softness. He'd heard somewhere that dragons were more intelligent than most animals, even amongst Pokémon, and he wondered if Bolt understood what was going on all along. Feeling the Luxury Ball under his right shoe, Kenta tramped down hard upon it, and it cracked to bits like a Christmas tree ornament. Ignoring the feeling of the shattered ball, Kenta wrapped his arms around Bolt's neck and held him tightly, tenderly, as a beloved dog. There'd been no time before, but it had just occurred to him that he'd never thanked Bolt for saving his life. Bolt, he said, you were all I had left, and you came through for me. I don't deserve you. Letting go of the Salamence's neck, Kenta looked him seriously, straight in the eye. It looks like we're in a tight spot, buddy. Up until further notice, we're gonna have to keep a low profile. That means you especially, Bolt. You're much bigger than me, so you'll have to find a place to hide until we can get you a new ball. Find somewhere warm, somewhere that the snow won't be able to... Able to... Without warning, his body suddenly collapsed. He wouldn't wake up again for three days.